from from the group as we as we possibly can. Um, so what I'm going to ask you guys to do, those of you who are interested in, interested in asking questions, to post them in the Q and A, and then others uh, as you watch the Q and A, feel free to upvote those those questions so we can know which ones you guys want to know the answers to most, and we can try to keep those at the sort of at the top of the list. But um, this is being recorded, so and we will post it on our YouTube channel, um, and I'll share a link in the chat uh, to that uh, during the presentation. But um, again, feel free to ask questions. Again, we're going to cover a lot of ground, but I'll turn it over to our moderator, Joanne Keenan, uh, executive health executive editor for healthcare at Politico. And without further ado, Joanne, take it away. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Um, I'm just going to give sort of a quick lay of the land um, on where we are right now with the understanding that wherever I think we are at four o'clock your time may be very different place an hour from now because news is moving very, very fast. Um, uh, sort of dizzy, dizzifying, if that's a word. Um, obviously, um, and, and we also decided in our prep meeting of the day with the Supreme Court is off the table for now. We're not going to discuss it. It seems so unlikely that they will scrap the ACA, whether they get rid of it on standing, the, the case, or whether they just get rid of a, um, the, the mandate and leave everything else intact. We're, we're not, I've just taken care of it. It's done. All right. So the two big topics are obviously the coronavirus and the incoming administration of uh, President-elect Biden, and which, of course, coronavirus will be the top priority, at least on the domestic side, and probably the top priority. Um, of, of the, the new administration. You've all looked at the statistics day to day. You know, when I saw 10 days ago or something in one of our newsletters um, that we were gonna be having a million cases a week within, I think at that point they were saying by late after Thanksgiving, we're sort of there, we're there now. I thought it was a typo. I thought someone made a mistake. I thought one of my reporters got like, their anxiety got ahead of the facts. And I was saying, wait, wait, that can't be. And that's where we are. So, and I think we are all seeing that um, it, it's everywhere. It's in every state. It is in blue states and red states, north, south, east, west, rural, urban. Um, the, the interior of the country is worse, but the coasts are really bad as well. Um, and I think we're seeing that people who I think many of us know people who don't know where they got exposed, people who are taking care of themselves and being cautious, but it is spreading in a, in a pretty frightening way. Um, obviously the vaccine news last week and more vaccine news today, but they're not magic bullets. These are not gonna be available tomorrow. And they, they really look good, whether they look quite this good. And you know, when we have more data, they may not be 94% effective. They may, be, they may drop a bit, but it looks like we're gonna have tools. But the distribution of these vaccines, they're very complicated. The whole world needs them. Some of them have to, the, the Pfizer one needs to be frozen at 90 degrees below zero. Um, these are complicated. Um, getting them to the, or the political fights about who should get them first. Um, you know, right now there's, that has not really been decided and the Biden administration will clearly have a say in that. Um, when I began coming into our morning newsroom meetings, you know, last January, almost a year ago, and I started talking about the virus. You know, everyone just sort of rolled their, oh, there she goes again. Um, you know, they just wanted to talk about the elections. And gradually they began paying a little bit more attention to me and getting a little more nervous and starting to ask me, I better buy a lot of diapers, right? <laughs> um, and in ret and then when, right before we went home, you know, right before our own office closed in March, you know, people were saying to me, we should have listened, you know, you were right, we didn't listen. But then I was saying things like, you know, we need to think about whether the elections are gonna be normal and if we're gonna have conventions. And they still thought I was nuts because in March they thought a month, two months, three months. So now when they reach out to me and say, you know, you were right, I say, you know what? I was wrong. You thought I was Cassandra and I was really Pollyanna. It is so much worse than I imagined. You know, the number of people who are ill, the damage to the economy, and our death toll is like having two or three planes drop from the sky every single day, day in and day out, and we're inured to it. And we have some people in Washington still saying it's really not a big deal. So um, it's really, 
you know, Biden is coming into economic devastation. He's coming into a virus, you know, unless people just, it's gotten so bad now that even in states that aren't shutting down, people might be changing their behavior. People might start wearing masks, going out less because everyone knows someone who's, you, you see the headlines, you can't avoid it at this point. There's still people who believe it's a hoax. There was an emergency room uh, nurse or an ICU nurse from South Dakota tweeting yesterday about patients screaming at her about, you know, as they were about to be intubated, saying it's all a plot from Joe Biden. It's not real. You know, why are you in this protective gear? And the, some of them, it's the last words they're going to say, because then they're intubated and who knows what happens. So Biden faces tremendous distrust. You know, all of his years of... Um, Knowing everybody in Washington, there's only so much. He doesn't know them. I mean, the Senate is a bunch of new people. He's going to have a either a Republican Senate or he's going to have a really, really narrow 50-50 Senate if, if they win both seats in Georgia with um, a, a uh, Kamala Harris being able to cast a vote, a tie vote, break a tie. He's not going to get his legislative agenda through. He may, he does have tremendous administrative powers, just like Trump didn't get repealed through, but he did a lot to change the ACA, Medicaid, and attempted to make changes in drug and cost. So I'm going to stop talking now because I think I'm over even saying I'd be fast. Um, and let me start int by introducing uh, Melinda, uh, who you all know because you're Vanderbilt people. So... Uh, she, uh, Melinda Bunton is the, joined the Vanderbilt School of Medicine in 2013 as a professor and founding chair of the Department of Health Policy, and in March 2018 was appointed the Mike Curb Chair for Health Policy. She worked at the CBO, the Congressional Budget Office, evaluating um, healthcare proposals on healthcare financing, prescription drugs, et cetera. Um, she worked at RAND, and she's a specialist in really health economics, health costs, coverage, uh, all that red ink that we have to deal with. There's a longer bio. She undergraduated at Princeton. I, I guess it's no longer the Woodrow Wilson School. Um, I forgot what they're calling it now, but you need to update your bio. And uh, her PhD is from Harvard. So Melinda. All right. Well, thank you, Joanne. And thank you, Jake, for kicking us off. Um, it's such a privilege to have someone with such insider Washington knowledge uh, to be our moderator and, um, and pull out a great conversation um, from the other wonderful colleagues I have on the panel. Uh, so just to reiterate and expand on a few things that Joanne said. First, this has been such a strange election season, right? We still don't know the balance of power in the Senate, but it's gonna be so close to 50-50 that it will be a constraint. And since I'm an economist, and I think about constraints a lot. I thought I would orient the next two minutes around what the constraints will be on the Biden administration and what it means. So the first one is that the election was not about a health issue. So arguably in 2018, voters came to the polls and were either for or against repeal of the ACA and that motivated a lot of their votes. This time, People didn't vote because of what we've traditionally thought about as health policy. They voted about a health issue and they voted about the pandemic. And so if there's one thing I think Biden has a mandate to do, it's deal with this pandemic better. Now, that's gonna be a tall order, but it is one area in which there could be a dramatic break as Joanne was, um, was discussing with the Trump administration. So we could expect a coordinated federal response to, around things like supplies, reagents, PPE, testing policies and the like, and also perhaps more prescriptive um, instructions to states around rollout of a vaccine. That's all within the purview of a new administration to do. Um, that said, they're coming in to a situation in which the pandemic, um, it will be the middle of the winter, and it might be even worse than the very dire situation that it looks like it's turning into right now. So second, um, what can be done in a fifth, with maybe a 50-50 Senate by administrative, um, uh, with administrative powers or executive powers? Without stepping on what uh, John, who's a true uh, expert on health insurance um, is gonna say, we can think about what the constraints are on a new administration again. And this is where what I worry about a lot, the money matters greatly. So because of the pandemic, we have spent an enormous amount of money as a country and our tax revenues are down. And so we will really be constrained in what Congress can do going forward in terms of reforming the ACA and adding coverage because adding coverage generally costs money. 
There are a few administrative things that can be done to roll back, for example, the Trump admission, uh, um, administration's regulations that kind of narrowed, if you will, the ACA. But again, purview is limited without congressional action, and John will get more into that. Um, in the area of what Biden can do for Medicare and Medicaid, the main federal programs, um, he cannot uh, lower the age uh, of eligibility for Medicare, um, as he proposed, again, without help from Congress. But he can do a couple of things um, as far as the Medicare and Medicaid programs are concerned. For example, he can reinvigorate the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Innovation, um, which uh, was still in operation during the Trump administration, but some real health policy nerds might remember that first thing that happened when Tom Price came in as Secretary of HHS was that he canceled a mandatory demonstration. Um, and I would say I would expect that part of HHS to be reinvigorated in a Biden administration. Um, there may also be ways uh, that they can roll back some regulations, for example, around block grants and work requirements um, that the Trump administration put forward, but expanding eligibility a lot or going into the territory as he proposed during the campaign of a public option will cost money. So that will really be a constraint. Um, it'll also be a constraint in that designing a public option that doesn't disrupt lots of other arenas in the health policy world, providers, insurers, um, competing plans is very, very difficult. And so even, um, even if uh, Biden had a fully formed plan for that, it would probably take a while to move through the Congress. So we can expect that to be something that could take a few years to unfurl. And we might also need to understand what toll this pandemic has taken on our fiscal situation to determine how many degrees of freedom we have and how much of a constraint um, budgetary uh, issues will be. And with that, I will turn it over to my colleague, John Graves. Let me introduce John. Um, John is an associate professor of Vanderbilt University School of Medicine, where he holds appointments in both the Department of Health Policy and the Department of Medicine. He's been doing interdisciplinary research on health economics and healthcare policy for 15 years. And the focus of his work is on the use of econometric and decision analytic methodologies to inform development, implementation, and evaluation of health reforms for both states and the federal government. He was involved with Massachusetts when they put through what we now tend to think of as Romney care in 2006, which became a model for what we still are calling Obamacare, or maybe it will become Biden care. Um, and he has his BA from the University of the South in, I always pronounced that wrong, Swanee, Tennessee, and his PhD from Harvard, I, see, I sense a trend. John. Thanks. Uh, so I am doing my talk today in a very 2020 uh, environment. I am home quarantined with a five-year-old and a three-year-old. So we either hear them scream or I'm outside. So I apologize for any, out, uh, any extra noise you might hear. So I'm gonna organize my talk uh, or my few minutes here around some themes I think we could see. First, what I'm calling the unwinding or areas of um, federal and state policy as, as it's directed by the feds where there is legal authority for the um, incoming Biden administration to unwind some Trump area policies. The second, what I'm calling um, some measures towards stability where I think it would take some legislative action, but there could be some traction, some bipartisan traction to get things moved forward. And then the third um, component would be more of the kind of reach issues that would require um, most likely a Democratic Senate um, for Biden to get what he wants to do. So um, on the unwinding component, there's been a, a number of both federal and state level initiatives that have been put in place over the last four years. At the federal level, what the Trump administration has done is loosen rules that effectively try to prop up and in, in, in some cases encourage people to shop in a parallel health insurance market to what Obamacare set up through heavily regulated insurance markets that can't um, discriminate based on pre-existing conditions, et cetera. So this has largely been done through um, what are known as short-term limited duration plans and association health plans. In Tennessee, we know of association health plans as the Farm Bureau plans that you see probably advertised quite a bit. So these short-term plans don't have to conform to uh, the Obamacare rules and regulations around pre-existing conditions, et cetera. They're extraordinarily cheap because they can underwrite individuals. The Obama administration had really scaled back. Um, this market has in, existed in parallel to the insurance exchanges that we typically think of as Obamacare for years. But the Obama administration scaled back on 
the ability of individuals to take up short-term plans and kind of string together a bunch of short-term plans for a year, as opposed to only being allowed to have them for a few months, as the name suggests. So uh, the Biden administration could dramatically scale back the loosening of regulations around that. And as well, the uh, Trump administration has been pretty aggressive and I would say liberal in terms of how they interpret waivers of uh, federal rules around the Medicaid program and the exchanges. So for example, we've seen a lot of uh, work requirements put in, in place by certain states. Those are making their way largely through the legal system and, and have gotten tripped up there. Tennessee uh, currently has a waiver for a block grant to uh, essentially freeze in place uh, and, and then index moving into the future our funding for our state Medicaid program. That has not been uh, approved yet. And so that could be something that the, the incoming administration um, does not approve or uh, does not let go forward. And finally, right before the election, we saw uh, another waiver approved in the state of Georgia, which did two things. Uh, on the unwinding component, um, one of the things it did was essentially strip out the ability of uh, consumers or people shopping for health insurance in Georgia to use the federal exchange website or even a state exchange website. Instead, they're going to have to go through a broker. So this would be something like uh, if you couldn't no longer use Orbitz or Travelocity to shop for uh, shop for a, a plane flight and instead you'd have to go through a travel agent. So that's something that the Biden administration could um, uh, could uh, uh, unwind when they get into office because that wouldn't start until the future. On the stability front, what we um, might have some uh, some traction for is what's known as reinsurance programs under also federal waivers. The Georgia waiver also had a reinsurance program, and this is a way to stabilize the insurance exchanges by uh, injecting it with money for very high cost individuals, thereby bringing down premiums. There's been a, quite a bit of um, action there uh, over the last four years. I would expect that to continue. And also ap appropriating cost sharing subsidies for uh, the Obamacare exchanges. The Trump administration very famously withheld them. Uh, and the insurers essentially uh, got around this by jacking up premiums on unsubsidized individuals. Um, I can get into more details on the expanding the ACA part in the Q&A if, if folks are interested in what Biden proposed. But for now, um, I'll just kick it off to my colleague, Stacy, after an introduction by Joanne. Okay, Stacy, uh, Dr. Stacy Dusetzina, I just call her Stacy because it's much easier. Um, she's an associate professor uh, in the Department of Health Policy and an Ingram Associate Professor of Cancer Research at Vanderbilt. She, her work focuses uh, really on drug costs and drug utilization and evidence-based policies um, on affordability and access, um, which might, once we figure that out, people will have better access to the drugs that can in fact save lives. Um, she's been recognized um, for um, quite a bit of her work, including a lot of work on cancer drugs. Uh, being, um, a, she, she was an invited participant for two working groups on patient access to affordable cancer drugs hosted by the President's Cancer Panel. And because she can speak, she can speak drug costs in plain English. We all quote her a lot. So, uh, Stacy. Thanks, Jan. Um, so today I'm going to uh, talk about drug prices, which is probably no surprise given that bio and introduction. Um, so I want to talk about um, what Biden's plan looks like. So just four, four key items, and then maybe talk for a moment about what may be the most realistic part. So I, I guess I could sum it up by saying that what I'm hopeful for is less talk and more action when it comes to drug prices and drug pricing policy under the Biden administration. And so there are a few things that um, are on the agenda. One is, uh, sound, will sound familiar to most of you, is government negotiating for drug prices. And this is a little bit of a reach goal, but the idea here is that we need to start actually negotiating and setting prices uh, for drugs and including both Medicare and other payers as part of those negotiations. So the Biden plan looks a lot like what we saw in HR3, the House bill that came out last year. There is also a proposal to limit price increases to inflation. So we've seen a lot of concern about the price increases that drugs are um, experiencing. And so the plan includes that inflation-based uh, rebate. So if the price goes up faster than inflation, you get that money back if you're Medicare or if you're a public option plan. There's also um, an aggressive proposal to actually negotiate the price of expensive specialty drugs, including cancer treatments, at the time that they come onto the market. 
And under that proposal, they're thinking about an independent organization to do those evaluations of what the drug could be priced based on its relative value and also potentially using other countries' prices for those drugs as a potential input. And uh, the last of the four items I'll talk about is uh, related to what patients spend and in particular what Medicare beneficiaries spend. So there is a proposal to limit out-of-pocket spending on Medicare Part D. It's a key gap in coverage and protections for seniors. Um, Everyone else's health insurance has an out-of-pocket maximum these days, and Part D is a notable exception. Um, Melinda talked about constraints, and I want to talk a little bit about compromise, because I think that there are two um, policies here that have some possibilities, even if we have a split Senate. Um, and one of them is um, the inflation-based rebates. So this proposal came up in um, the House and the Senate last year in major drug pricing bills. And so I think it has some possibilities for moving forward. It's also something we currently do in Medicaid. So there's some precedent for thinking about this being important when we're talking about public payers and public dollars. And uh, the other is the cap on out-of-pocket cost on Part D. Uh, there are many, many reasons to reform the Medicare Part D program. It doesn't work for high priced drugs. There have been a lot of ways that we've patched it over the years, but we're seeing that, you know, the boat is sinking. There are so many holes here that we really need a redesign. And I think there's bipartisan agreement on what that would look like even. So I'm hopeful that uh, we see that moving forward. Uh, so with that, I'm gonna stop. So we have plenty of time for Q and A. I wanna actually just follow up with Stacy before we go back to other topics. Um, the public really wants lower drug prices. It's bipartisan. It's been a top, um, pre-pandemic, it was the top health care item in many polls for both Democrats and Republicans since around 2015, I think. Um, Trump, actually, some of his ideas were more akin to things Democrats had proposed for a number of years, but a Republican president did not get most of it through a Republican Congress. And even though the Senate is likely to, we don't know. I mean, it's not, it's hard to predict because it's not a normal runoff with everything else at stake. But it, it, Grassley is not going to be the head Republican, whether it's chairman or ranking member. Grassley won't be in charge of the Senate Finance Committee on the Republican side. He was quite interested in bringing down drug prices. He did a bill with Wyden. Um, and I don't think he got a single Republican sponsor, maybe had one or two. It never got out. Crapo would be the unless something unpredictable happens. It looks like Crapo would be the top Republican on finance. He has not been at all sympathetic. Um, if Trump couldn't get through a Republican Congress, can Biden get any of the drug uh, redesign or price measures through a Republican Congress? So I think that they can get, um, they could potentially get the inflation rebates because that that is something that we've seen um, some bipartisan support for, although you're right, Grassley was the main champion there um, and other Republicans were a little bit more resistant to it. Um, I think that we could get Part D reform because that's really patient facing. Uh, the pharmaceutical industry is not you know, that opposed to it because it does help patients. It doesn't necessarily harm their bottom line as much, although there are some other you know, pressures on them uh, for paying more once people reach the catastrophic coverage phase of uh, the benefit. But the drug price, uh, I'm not sure we would see any major movements on the negotiating for drug prices because we have coronavirus and the tension between drug price cuts and innovation and that argument that comes up and I think it's important to recognize we're asking a lot of the industry right now to just, you know, everybody go as hard as they can towards a coronavirus vaccine. And I think that because of that, there's gonna be a lot more resistance for doing anything that impacts drug prices directly. That said, if we were in a situation where the industry decided to basically price gouge people for the coronavirus vaccine, I think that could turn everyone, you know, kind of, I, like I usually say, it's like a hero or villain story. So if, if they go and develop a great vaccine and we end up getting out of this mess, great. 
if we end up in a situation where we feel like we're being held hostage due to prices, you know, being higher than what, you know, is kind of thought of as fair, um, you know, it could be that we get more enthusiasm for drug price reform, but I just don't see it happening in this current environment. And, um, one of the things that Biden can do, um, as Trump has done, is, you know, let states innovate. We do have 1332 waivers. Uh, Medicaid has 1115s, which predated the ACA. Um, states can do a lot. You mentioned the, the efforts to bring down, to stabilize premiums. What about the public option? Um, with, Washington has already moved toward a public option. It's not at all robust. Uh, Colorado, I think, is still in the studying and talking about it stage. We saw several states look at Medicaid buy-ins. I don't think any of them finalized that either. Um, given that, you know, there's sort of is. Biden's un unlikely to get a public, it's not impossible, but unlikely at this point to get a public option through the Senate. Are we gonna, how much can a state go on coverage? Um, I would say the most likely route is gonna be through reinsurance. There seems to be, that predates the Trump administration and has continued um, throughout. Um, the other action on waivers I would expect to see is some unwinding, as I mentioned earlier, of some of the work requirement waivers. Uh, my understanding is that CMS maintains legal authority to withdraw a waiver. We've had some questions on this. Um, so, e so even if a waiver is approved between now and January 20th, um, the new CMS under a Biden administration could then go back and withdraw it uh, under legal, their legal authority. Um, and so I, I would expect that that would be the most likely areas. I haven't seen terribly much, but that might just reflect um, the political environment over the last few years around um, going through a 1332 waiver to, to introduce a public option in, in any other state, but that could certainly bubble up and it remains to be seen. I, I don't have a good read on how likely that would be. Um, just those, those plans were largely put on hold for about four years, so it's hard to know where they're gonna head. Um, there also will likely be some waiver activity around uh, around the coronavirus response, in particular as it pertains to PPE and um, getting things to um, to vulnerable populations in the Medicaid program, et cetera. So I would ex also expect to see some waiver, um, some pretty aggressive uh, waiver activity on the uh, coronavirus uh, side of the equation as well. Yeah, I mean, we know that um, the, no state actually has work requirements in effect right now. The courts have stopped them and other states have said they've pulled back waiting to see what the courts eventually decide. And by the time they decide, the waivers may have expired. Um, yeah. No state, Tennessee has its block grant proposal, but it's a different animal than what um, CMS talked about in terms of block grants. I think only Oklahoma had actually put in a, way, a block grant proposal and then they withdrew it. Um, so yeah, I guess that leaves the biggie, uh, the big mystery one is Georgia, which is not Medicaid. It's, it's really letting a state opt out of the ACA. Um, Melinda, do you wanna, are you in a position to explain why that's a significant development? And the, new administrations don't usually undo all the waivers. They usually sort of renegotiate them at um, renegotiation yeah, time. That's when they, correct, <laughs> that's correct. This one, what John said is, is, is also correct. It is possible that you could change the regulatory guidance under which those waivers were filed. So for example, work requirements is a prime example. There's regulatory guidance around that. There's also been some regulatory guidance around extending waivers for longer periods of time. Um, that was used, for example, to um, extend Indiana's waiver for, I believe, 10 years. Um, that would be something I would expect by the administration to revisit. Uh, of course, if a waiver is rescinded, then a state would have an ability to appeal it, um, but uh, that could really tie things up for a while. Um, and I don't, um, I can't think off the top of my head of, of any instance in which um, a major waiver had been either sort of rescinded or appealed. So we'd really be in some uncharted territory there. I mean, I mean the thing about Georgia is it was approved, but it's not actually in effect for this effect, year. Yeah. So yeah. The people in Georgia haven't experienced half of, it, half of it is likely to move forward. The reinsurance component is very likely to remain. It's just the other half where requiring people to essentially use a broker instead of a website. Um, it's it's hard to make an argument that that is uh, in support of the a of the premise of the ACA to allow consumers to make informed choices on their own. But um, it, like Melinda said, I'm not aware of uh, mm. it, it. We're in kind of. Legally, it's fine, but uncharted territory in terms of unwinding a waiver that's already in existence or renegotiating it before its term is up. 
-hmm. What about putting in another layer of consumer protections? Could you just say, you know, brokers have to affirmatively, because one of the problems is if these plans A aren't compliant, you know, they, you're not getting the protections at an ACA plan. And also you can't get your subsidy if you're eligible for a subsidy. So is there a way to sort of add a layer of, you know, try to see some kind of compromise where you don't undo what Georgia just got permission to do, but yeah, you know, I don't know a great maybe. deal about, there's really not a great precedent for this, but is there a way that you can turn it into something that the Biden people have lived with for a while? Or allow the state to come up with their own uh, exchange website, which has been allowed all the, all the way through since 2014. New Jersey, I think, is the most recent that did. Okay, so let's start working in some audience, some some questions. We've actually touched on some of them. Um, you know, one of the, the, the states that have not done expansion, and, you know, Obama tried to encourage them. Clearly, Trump did not. There's still, I think, 12, and I think it's the best estimate is around three and a half million people who don't have any insurance option. Biden would have addressed that with the public option. If he got the public option through, anyone in a Medicaid non-expansion state who was eligible would have been auto-enrolled um, on the same financial term as basically free, no premiums. And other unemployed, uh, unemployed people, people who lost jobs would also go into that public option. Um, it's been interesting to watch the state referendum, the, the ballot initiatives, because even in really conservative states like Oklahoma and Idaho and Nebraska, um, when Medicaid has been on the ballot, it won, and it won pretty big on most of them. I think in, in Idaho, it was 60 something percent. Um, is that the, is there something Biden, is, the, is there a carrot that Biden could offer that he could get through the Senate? Or um, are we just gonna go through this ballot initiative and eventually, I mean, it took 20 something years. It took until 1982 from 65 to, to 1982 for every single state to opt into regular Medicaid. Arizona was the last. And they made up for it by being one of the first expansion states. But what can, can Biden do anything? So there are there are some options. So Jake, if you could put up my first slide. So um, one of the things that Biden uh, proposed during the election was to expand on the ACA subsidy schedule. So I'll walk you through this very briefly. On the x-axis here, you have income as a percent of poverty. So for example, at 100% of poverty for an individual, that's about $12,760. For a family of four, 100% of poverty is $26,200. So that's the x-axis here. And you can see then on the y-axis, this is the percentage of income that um, somebody would pay towards their health insurance premium under the ACA. So what you see is uh, starting at about 100% 100 of poverty there on the left, that first kind of step up, um, individuals there pay about 2% of their income and the rest is taken care of by a federal tax credit. And you can see as this kind of oddly shaped polygon goes up the income distribution, once you get to 400% of poverty, you have what's known as the subsidy cliff. So at about 400% of poverty, individuals are paying almost 10% of their income toward their premiums. So, you know, for a single there, that would be, you know, about $125 a month. Um, or, yeah. Um, so, uh, and, um, but after 401% of poverty, it falls off a cliff. So Jake, if you can come, or actually, let me go back one slide. On the far left, what you see is what's known as the coverage gap. And this is what is pinching the states that haven't expanded Medicaid. So up, at, up to the dotted line there is 138%, that vertical dotted line is 138% of poverty. The ACA had intended for Medicaid to fill in up to that point. But as we know, because of the 2012 SCOTUS decision, it's an option for states. So that coverage gap exists because the subsidies don't, under the ACA don't start until 100% of poverty, that first step up there. What um, Biden has proposed, Jake, if you go to the next slide, is to essentially extend the subsidy schedule up the income distribution so that nobody, um, even above 400% of poverty, would pay more than 8.5% of income. Now, what the Biden plan did below 138% of poverty was this public option, which probably, just given the composition of the Senate, the likely composition of the Senate is going to be a very tough sell. But one option that would be available is just to extend that 8.5% percent of income tax across the board. And it would create a really weird looking uh, subsidy graph here, but it would be one mechanism that could, um, could get some bipartisan support just to give individuals in non-expansion states some financial support for buying health insurance, where they'd only have to pay about eight and a half percent of their income. Um, and so that would be one option kind of in the middle. That's all I need for this one, Jake. 
you can turn it off. <laughs> um, we've got a couple of questions about um, the Tennessee block grant waiver, and it's not the same. It's not. I guess it's the short answer is that they have a block grant in good economic times and they get to get more money in bad economic times. Uh, that's an oversimplification, but it hasn't been approved yet. Um, uh, Melinda, are you in a position or John, who's the best verse since you're in Tennessee to talk about you know, what it would do, um, how it looks different in a pandemic and do you think it'll get approved in the remaining nine weeks or 10 weeks or whatever it is we have in the Trump administration? Well, I'm not, I'm not good enough to predict what uh, an administration might do in the final weeks, um, but uh, I guess I would be surprised if it were approved. Uh, it was constructed to really insulate Tennessee as much as possible. So while the federal government wanted block grants to limit federal liability, um, Tennessee constructed its block grant uh, application to really limit Tennessee's liability. Um, and it really only had a couple of pitfalls, but one of them was a pandemic. Um, so, uh, you know, an unexpected um, uh, extra demand for healthcare. Um, and so I think there would be a lot of questions raised about whether it was the right thing to do given where we are right now. And for that reason, I think it'd be unlikely that it would be shaken loose um, and approved in these final weeks. Um, yeah. That said, it's been a crazy year, so who who knows? <laughs> it's almost over. <laughs> um, with that, in a pandemic, um, since we're in an abnormal situation, um, and it, it, would that Medicaid waiver increase coverage right now, or it would be a status quo for coverage right now? In the um, future, it might shrink it, but well, in the, the, the point was not to the point of the waiver was not to increase coverage. Um, the point of the waiver was to give greater flexibility to Tennessee for the people it's currently covered. Um, but of course, because many people um, who fall into lower income groups have lost their um, insurance and lost their incomes, more people in Tennessee do qualify for Medicaid under the, the prior enroll, uh, eligibility standards. So that's happening regardless of the block grant waiver. Let's talk a little bit about public health because um, one thing we always, I mean, the problem with public health is when it works, you don't see it. Mm -hmm. And then lawmakers say, well, why are we spending money on that? We don't need that. And we get into this vicious circle where we, we build it up and then we tear it down and then we have a crisis. We built it up after 9-11 and anthrax. Uh, we spent a fair amount of money. Uh, we called it bioterror spending, but it was a dual use, right? It was Bill Frist, who most of your audience know, was one of the co-authors of that. They called it, it was him and Teddy Kennedy. They called it bio defense after, you know, anthrax. It was a very easy way of getting that through the Senate. But of course, um, this, it's also for non-bio. I mean, not for, not for natural bio. Um, and then his health department's got a lot of money. Great recession came, bye bye healthcare money, health public health money. And they, they are just, I mean, even if there was a better coordinated national response and more of a structured national approach, some things have to be done on the ground by state public health and county public health and city public health. And some of them just don't have any money, really under-resourced. We were, I think all of us, we were talking the other day, we've all heard stories about hospitals that in the middle of the pandemic are printing out paper records from the electronic health records and faxing them to their public health department. Mm -hmm. Is there, you know, in our, we have, a, we have a nation with a you know very short attention span and a lot of political divisions. Do, do any of you think that this is something that we could get through investment in public health? Or is the there's gonna be such a huge deficit by the time we're out of this that people aren't gonna to wanna to spend money on it? And we know the pandemic's over. I mean, is our attention span so short that it's really just a split second? Or you know, do we have five minutes to get a public health bill through? <laughs> I'll take the first stab at that, but then I want to hear what my colleagues have to say. Uh, I mean, this I mean, this is a singular event in almost everyone on the planet's lifetime, this pandemic. Um, so I do think we're going to have a longer attention span for this one. Um, and one of the things that I like, one of the Biden proposals that I thought had some legs, especially in a bipartisan sense, was the idea of having a public health service score. We have a lot of people who are out of work. Um, many of them are young people looking for their first job and things like that. And so the appeal of a public health service corps would be that we could give employment um, to people who otherwise wouldn't have jobs and we could fulfill a public mission. 
Um, and I do think we have a nice history of, of programs like that that have had enjoyed bipartisan support, AmeriCorps, the Peace Corps, and the like. So it could be time for that. Um, it was a nice idea that, that had multiple um, positive attributes to it. Uh, I do think that the public also has long supported um, uh, increased funding for NIH. Uh, and I think they now have an understanding of the role of the CDC that they never had before, right? When you do public health well, then you never see public health. And that is, um, that's the pitfall of it. But now people, I do think, understand more the value of public health and we will see increased funding for it. I have been told that, you know, Washington is a big guessing game of who's going to get what job right now. And there's also a variant of, you know, guess the Republican. But the... Um, and Bob Corker's name comes up in that year, former senator. Um, I mean, I have been told that the CDC is a big priority for the Biden administration, that they understand uh, that it needs strong leadership. Um, lots of things went wrong in the last year, some internal and some external. Um, so I have heard that that is a big priority. I do not know who's getting that job. I'm not sure they know. Um, but, you know, I think that that is... I think they see that as sort of the outside of HHS secretary. I think they see that as the pivotal job to fill because it's really going to be hard to rebuild that agency. And, um, it, you know, and there, there are certainly questions, you know, some of the testing decisions were not political. It was from the scientists. And in retrospect, they weren't all great decisions. So um, we have a, st a question for Stacy on drugs. I mean, I think it's really one, one thing that's really important when you talk about drug prices is there's, you can save consumers money, but you're not really bringing down the drug prices. So you're, you're either the taxpayer is paying more or the insurer is paying more, in which case they pass it on to us in terms of a premium. So are, are we really, are most of the Biden proposals bringing down drug prices or bringing down our spending? And then talk a little bit about Medicare B and D and what he's, how, how some of his ideas would, would affect both of them, B being more inpatient and, well, not inpatient, but infusions, doctor administered drugs, mm -hmm. um, chemotherapy being one of them. I guess some would um, the monoclonal antibodies be B if they get into wide use for, they're very expensive for coronavirus. And then D is that what we you know buy at the drugstore or our mail orders. Yeah, exactly. Um, so that's a, that's, I guess I'll say what if, Biden had his way and based on the plan that he's put forward, I think he would try to tackle spending on drugs because the plan that they put forward looks an awful lot like HR3, which was uh, set up to do drug price negotiation for both physician administered, those part B drugs and orally administered drugs. And that those prices would be available not just to Medicare, but to all payers. So private plans could also take advantage of those lower prices if they decided to do that. So I think that, you know, the plan is potentially to reduce spending on drugs. I don't know that he'll be able to get there. Um, and I think it is an important question about, you know, if we just lower prices to consumers, is that a good idea. It's obviously going to come back to us in the form of higher premiums. So I, I think that's where some of the redesign of the Medicare benefit, it does create these differences in who spends and when they spend. So it limits how much beneficiaries spend in the current phase where Medicare picks up the most, the biggest part of the tab. In the redesign, they actually put more pressure on the pharmaceutical companies to pick up the tab for more expensive drugs. So when somebody spends a ton of money on drugs and they go into the catastrophic phase, now the beneficiary pays nothing, but the pharmaceutical companies would have to start paying in that phase of the benefit. Right now, we have pharmaceutical companies paying for brand name drugs filled in the coverage gap but that kind of limits the total amount that they have to spend only to that coverage gap spending. So this is kind of a way to say, you know, if you've priced your drugs really high, you'll be spending or filling more of those drugs in the catastrophic phase and you have to kind of pay a tax on that. So I think he tries, you know, to tackle both and then the broad aspects of reaching not just Medicare for drug price negotiations, but other payers, I think are all important um, attributes of the plan. 
And what about the various ideas of pegging our drug prices to uh, an index of, of overseas prices, which Trump, you know, he pushed it and then it sort of sounded like it was just a, you know, sort of a carrot stick deal that he wasn't going to do it. He was going to try to get other kind of concessions from pharma and then there weren't any concessions and he went back to, to IPI. Um, is, is, does, does Biden have a version of that? Um, yes. So, th yeah, that's part of that's part of the negotiations for the Biden plan. I will say that e even of, as of this afternoon, uh, the Trump administration says they're trying to move forward with rulemaking around this um, favored nations proposal, which would basically limit how much Part B drugs and some Part D drugs uh, could could be priced. Um, and that is kind of tied to the cost in other countries. So it's rapidly evolving still. <laughs> what, what will we see by the end of the Trump administration to be determined? But you know, if they move forward in you know, the rulemaking process or try to push this through, it may actually put more options on the table for Biden because they've already started a process around drug prices and tying them to those in other countries. So this is a very uh, hot moving area as of like just this afternoon, reading some news articles about it. Um, so, you know, we'll see. I, I think the tying prices to other countries is complicated. We've written about this before around issues like, you know, a lot of times we get the drugs in the US first. So if you're gonna use other countries prices, we might not know what those will be for a couple of years. Um, so I think there's some complicating factors to doing that, but you know, it certainly would lower the, the list prices of our drugs, um, if nothing else. So before we go into our wrap up, I want to sort of have Melinda talk a little bit about coverage in our current system, which is the ACA, which did not get repealed. Um, but it also is really quiet. I mean, I can't see everybody's faces on this talk, but I, I think if I asked, how, you know, were you all aware that and open enrollment is going on right now and only last six weeks, I'd get a lot of vague stares because we haven't heard anything about it. Trump did not um, do a special enrollment period. He was urged to, to make it easier for people who lost their jobs and insurance to, uh, he could have opened a special period and let people who lost their jobs during the, the pandemic recession get covered. He did not streamline that process. When you do lose your job, even if there's no national um, special enrollment period. If you, you know, if you're divorced, if you lost your insurance, there are times you can you can sign up outside of the regular enrollment period. He didn't make that easier. So what can Biden do that's basically doesn't require Congress, doesn't require a lot of money either to either reopen things in in, in 2020 after 2021 after he takes office, or to to make you know more than an invisible or almost invisible um, an open enrollment period a year from now, the economy will not be all better and we will still have healthcare access problems and we will have, um, and they're just, we haven't talked much about disparities. I mean, Biden has made, is making this a priority. He's put people on his panel who are, that's what they do. They do disparities, but the uninsured and the Medicaid population and the people who are being hit hardest by this pandemic were also the people who are most left out of the system to begin with. So what could, uh, just quickly, and then we'll sort of wrap up. But I think coverage and I'll let John take that one actually. Okay, um, he's he's a student of all of the things that you can do in a regulatory with, with a regulatory. Um, tool. Well, you could just tweet about it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, they could extend the open enrollment period. Uh, they they have authority to both widen it and move it um, within the calendar year. Um, they, uh, another area where the Trump administration has really rolled back has it been in terms of the navigators that help people enroll. And so you could see some action there, which could, would potentially give a boost to enrollment. Mm -hmm. um, so there, there, there's some things that they can do around the margin, you know, both in terms of communications around open enrollment, um, keeping it open for longer. We did a piece now, it feels like 10 years ago, but it must have been five years ago. Uh, about moving open enrollment to the tax season when people are, are have more liquid cash rolling around because they get their tax rebates. So there's a lot of things that they can do kind of on those margins, but uh, anything that, you know, the other thing too is anything that adjusts the subsidy schedule would only require a reconciliation bill in Congress, meaning that it would, wouldn't be subject to the filibuster. Um, so, you know, tweaking the subsidy schedule, things like that, um, you know, in ways that could garner some bipartisan support could be, uh, could be on the table as well. 
So Melinda has a closing slide, I believe, right? Do you have one more? Sure, if Jake can put it up. It actually uh, relates to my comments from earlier, uh, which are that there are so many constraints on what can be done. Um, this was a close election. And uh, so <clears throat> all I wanted to show here was that when you look at what my former colleagues at the Congressional Budget Office were projecting uh, earlier this year about spending going forward, you can see that big spike right over 2020, and that is our CARES Act spending um, to combat the pandemic and to give people um, income supports. Uh, you can also see that there's been some increase um, in other types of discretionary spending. All of that has added to our national debt. And so while we would have ordinarily expected that top line major, labeled major health programs to, ex uh, to go up, um, we also have to contend with net interest on the federal debt going up. And what this means is that Congress will be constrained. It doesn't mean that we can't incur more debt to get out of a pandemic, and that might be wise. It just means that going forward into the future, you have to figure out what you're going to cut or how you're going to raise taxes, um, because we can't postpone this forever. And yet, as Joanne was saying at the beginning of the hour, COVID-19 cases still climb. We had a record day here in Tennessee today. Uh, we had over 8,000 cases reported today. Um, nearly 1,000 right here in Nashville, where, we, where we're sitting. Uh, so that's quite sobering, um, and we expect that hospitalizations and deaths will follow. But all, given all that, um, this is a unique time for policymaking to both address existing gaps and challenges um, in access to health care and health insurance, and to respond to this pandemic. So there's really never been a more important election for health policy. And I just find it such a such privilege to be able to hear Joanne's um, insider take and also the uh, take of my esteemed colleagues, Stacey DeSitzina and John Graves. Um, when you hear them talk and you hear the level of detail that their answers involve, you understand how complex and multifaceted health policy is. Um, so it's a privilege to work with them. Um, and they are a real, real resource or to any policymaker um, hoping to make positive change in these arenas. So I just wanna say thank you, Joanne. Thank you, my co-panelists. And thank you to the over 200 people who attended this event online. Um, we are easy to find here at Vanderbilt uh, if you have follow-up questions. Um, and uh, if you have any uh, questions um, about the work that we've cited, you can certainly be in touch with our moderator, Jake Lowry, uh, and visit our website um, for more of the resources that we mentioned. So thank you all. Any final words, Joanne? I guess I think that just very briefly that this is unprecedented and we also don't know what we're gonna be like as a country when we come out of it. I don't think we know what we're gonna be like as individuals. I don't think we know how the stress, you know, I go through every day, I have a hard job, it's interesting. You know, all of us are putting one foot in front of the other. We got some of, many of us have kids at home or um, elderly relatives. There's a lot of stress in life. There's a lot of demands on us and we're going through a national trauma. And how that affects us and how that affects how we look at things like healthcare, the pre-existing conditions are we gonna, you know, we, we've come a long way as a country. We don't believe as a country, we don't believe in that healthcare is a right. We do believe in covering pre-existing conditions and that's a change. So what else will change? Mm -hmm. um, you know, with these burdens of this disease, which may, we may have a whole new population of chronically ill people. We don't know how long these symptoms last. We don't know if there are people who look healthy now, we're gonna develop a problem in five years. So I think, you know, I like to think even after 20 years in Washington, I'm still an optimistic person. So I'd like to think that we'll come out with some ability to solve problems um, and some understand that we've gone through a collective national and global trauma. But I also am not real optimistic about the ability to get a lot done fast in Washington. So, um, And I think that's a, a startling contrast to how much got done so quickly by healthcare organizations around the country during the pandemic. What's happened here at Vanderbilt University Medical Center is pretty astounding. What frontline workers have done, have patched together, have learned on the fly is astounding. Uh, and I think they are a re their experiences are a real challenge to the status quo. Can we preserve some of the things that worked? Can we do better around things that didn't work? Um, will we, for example, continue telehealth in the future? Just so many questions raised by the pandemic. Um, 
but the response of the healthcare system was impressive and everyone pitching in. Um, and I hope everyone in Washington can carry a fraction of that spirit into the next Congress. And the science too, that we have a vaccine in less than a year. You know, Amazing. Two vaccines, we're probably gonna have four or five within another few months. So the, the amount of scientific collaboration, the amount of scientific speed, the sharing of scientific knowledge is really unusual. Um, you know, whether that's gonna create new models for solving other problems um, or whether they're gonna go back into the, uh, <laughs> I found it first mode um, remains to be seen. So I think we're just about out of time. Thank you for having me. This has been a fun talk with um, people I enjoy talking to. So um, do you need to announce your next one? Can you give me a piece <laughs> of paper? There will be another one in the spring, <laughs> topic yet to be determined. Um, yes, uh, I think you're right. Things are moving so fast. Who knows what the right topic for the spring is? But uh, the post-election um, research into policy and practice lecture has once again um, uh, been one of our biggest draws. So thank you for helping that to happen, Joanne. Okay, thanks. Bye, everyone.